Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present at the Global Congress on Neurology and Neuroscience. I'm Christopher Kent, Professor and Director of Evidence-Informed Curriculum and Practice at Sherman College of Chiropractic in the United States. Today, we're going to be talking about the high prevalence of abnormal findings in cervical spine MRI examinations and the potential neurological consequences associated with vertebral subluxation. Vertebral subluxations occur when changes in the position or motion of the spinal segment adversely affect neurological function. The adverse neurological effects may occur in both somatic and autonomic structures. In 1927, Stevenson defined subluxation as a condition of a vertebra that has lost its proper juxtaposition with the one above or the one below or both, to an extent less than a luxation, which impinges nerves and interferes with the transmission of mental impulses. Mechanical and degenerative changes associated with vertebral subluxation may result in a variety of neurological consequences. Hewitt described four physical mechanisms of biological communication. The first is diffusion of particles along concentration gradients such as osmotic exchange. The second is diffusion of quanta along electromagnetic gradients. Uh, this would include electrophysiologic phenomena such as ECG, EMG, EEG, and so forth. The third is transmission of substances within structured channels, including blood, lymph, and cerebrospinal fluid, or on a cellular level, axoplasma. And the fourth is wave propagation where we have compression rarefaction type phenomenon or soliton waves. A number of putative neurobiological mechanisms associated with spinal subluxation have been described. These include cord compression and adverse cord tension, nerve root compression, local irritation, vertebral artery compromise, autonomic dysfunction, alterations in coherence and oscillatory patterns, and disafferentation and neuroplasticity. Mechanical factors include compression and stretch. Spinal nerve roots have been shown to be exquisitely sensitive to compression block. Similarly, adverse mechanical tension on the spinal cord associated with altered spinal curves may also adversely affect neural function. In this radiograph of the cervical spine, you can see that we have a loss of the normal cervical curve. If we draw a line along the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, George's line, we can see that at this level, we have an osteophyte, uh, which is potentially uh, impinging on a spinal nerve root. This film was read as normal initially because it was felt that a mere alteration in cervical curvature associated with disc thinning and mild osteophytosis was unlikely to have any clinical significance. However, if we draw lines along the inferior aspect of each vertebral body, we see that when we have a normal spinal curve, these lines tend to converge posteriorly. However, in the instant case we just demonstrated, the lines actually diverge at the affected level and we also see abnormal biomechanics in the high cervical spine between C1 and C2, the atlas and the axis. A degenerative cascade occurs where aberrant pathomechanics, changes in the position or motion of our vertebra and altered curves cause ligamentous tugging. This leads to focal inflammation, the deposition of yellow marrow or replacement with the normal hemopoietic red marrow, and eventually the development of osteophytes. So in this cadaveric specimen, we can see how this degenerative cascade may manifest. Uh, here we see the nice red hemopoietic marrow, but note that in the posterior inferior section here, we're starting to see yellow material forming. Uh, next level down, we can see uh, this kind of wedge-shaped deposition of yellow material. And again, within the vertebral body, changes in the homogeneity of the red marrow. 
we can also see alteration in disk spaces and how these changes may actually encroach on the spinal canal. So if we go back to the case that we described with the radiograph, uh, this T2 magnetic resonance image uh, demonstrates what was going on functionally as well as mechanically. Uh, this T2 weighted image shows white CSF, anything including water will appear bright, so healthy hydrated discs appear white, uh, but we can see at the affected levels, uh, instead of low signal intensity in the bodies, we have high signal intensity, suggesting edema and an inflammatory process. We can also see that the posterior material is causing impression on the fecal sac, and this would certainly help to explain why the patient was complaining of symptoms that were not of dermatomal distribution. Uh, she certainly was not exaggerating her symptoms or malingering as had been suggested, but there's a sound biological basis for her symptoms and the clinical manifestations of this subluxation complex. If we look at a motion MRI of a relatively healthy individual, uh, we can see, again, if we draw a line along the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies, how there's no compromise of the spinal cord. But in this individual, we again can see that at the affected level, as the patient flexes and extends, degenerative material is causing intermittent compression of the spinal cord. And this, of course, can have adverse neurological consequences. Another neurobiological mechanism which can adversely affect the function of nerves due to compression is dentate ligament distortion. When a vertebra becomes misaligned, uh, this may cause the dentate ligaments to produce abnormal tension on associated neural structures, and we can see the dentate ligaments very nicely with the blue arrows. This can actually influence the totality of the function of the nervous system, uh, and adverse mechanical tension can result in traction on the spinal nerve roots. Uh, here we can see the fibers of the cauda equina, and when altered spinal curves and altered spinal motion occur, uh, this can cause stretching of nerve, which can result in aberrant function. If we go back to the high cervical spine at the turquoise arrows, you can see the vertebral arteries, and there is some evidence that malalignment of the high cervical spine at the craniocervical junction can compromise vertebral artery function. And uh, at the yellow arrows, uh, we can see the emerging nerve roots. So when we see misalignment of a vertebra or alteration of spinal curves, this can produce abnormal mechanical tension on the cord. Uh, it may cause deformation of the dentate ligaments, interfering with the propagation of cerebrospinal fluid. And here we can see very nicely uh, an intracranial dentate ligament and the relationship between the spinal accessory nerve and C1 nerve again demonstrating how misalignment of the atlas or first cervical vertebra may adversely affect cranial nerve function as well as spinal nerve function. In this MRI, we can see uh, at the long arrows, uh, the dentate ligaments, very nicely illustrated. Uh, here, of course, we have the spinal cord and we have the cerebrospinal fluid, which appears bright on this T2 weighted sequence. If we look at another cervical spine MRI exam, we can see that there are very subtle degenerative changes beginning to appear here at the C4, C5 level. Uh, notice that we have a loss of the normal cervical curve here. And while this has to be interpreted with caution, uh, especially if the sequence was performed with the patient supine, uh, we do see that there's a change in the curvature of the spine and the distribution of stresses within the spine. And 
we're starting to see some very early changes, some uplifting of the posterior longitudinal ligament at that level. If we look at a transaxial image of the same patient, we can see the vertebral body, uh, the lamina, uh, this bifurcated spinous process, the spinal cord, the bright cerebrospinal fluid surrounding it, the anterior root, uh, the dorsal root, and also of interest is the very clear demarcation we have between the various layers of spinal muscles. Okay, let's compare that to this patient, a relatively young man, 38 years of age, whose plain radiographs demonstrated relatively little other than some disc space narrowing and some posterior wedging. Again, on this T2-weighted magnetic resonance image, we can look at the relative brightness of the intervertebral discs. We can see that we have uplifting of the posterior longitudinal ligaments due to disc material protruding posteriorly, and that this in turn is altering the cerebrospinal fluid signal at this level, uh, disrupting the flow of CSF and causing compression of the spinal cord. So we see that relatively subtle findings can have rather significant clinical consequences. Note too in this transaxial image uh, that we have posterior longitudinal ligament visible here. Uh, we have some asymmetrical posterior displacement of disc material. And notice that this intervertebral foramen is patent while in this one we're seeing uh, degenerative change arising from the, the uncinate processes. Note too, that unlike the earlier study, we do not see the nice clear demarcation between the layers of spinal muscles. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's sometimes observed in individuals that have suffered from surgical spine trauma. Obviously, spinal degeneration is a progressive process, and once again, uh, we can see in this patient the alterations in the contour of the CSF signal that are secondary to degenerative or spondylotic changes at multiple vertebral levels. And it's important to realize that because vertebral subluxations occur at different levels, degenerative changes will occur at different levels in different patients depending on the nature of spinal biomechanics. Although as we'll see later in the prevalence studies, uh, they do tend to occur at specific levels more frequently than others. Uh, so here we have an example of an MRI image where we created a cut plane uh, that can be seen here. And on the coronal reconstruction, we can see the odontoid process, the lateral masses. Uh, we can see a piece of vertebral artery here. Uh, and this allows us to look at the alignment between the structures of the occipital atlantoaxial region. In this transaxial view, we can see the atlas lateral masses here. Here's the contralateral side. This is the odontoid process, uh, the spinal cord and the CSF. And notice the increase in signal intensity that we see here compared to the contralateral side. This again suggests edema associated with trauma, which may be overlooked on plain radiographs uh, or even certain MRI studies. Another tool that we can use to evaluate spinal motion is video fluoroscopy. And note that in this patient, if we freeze the image at certain points, it looks like they have a reasonable cervical curve. On the other hand, note as flexion ensues, there's forward slippage at this motion segment, suggesting a loss of normal positioning. And the person has uh, kyphotic angulation that kind of falls into place at a certain point in that range of motion. Congenital or developmental variants, such as agenesis of the odontoid, can also cause alterations of spinal motion, as can be seen very clearly 
uh, where we have very robust AP movement of the atlas. So just how prevalent are these things? Um, in 325 reports of subjects that were referred for advanced imaging by doctors of chiropractic, we found that 35% exhibited evidence of disc degeneration, 5% uh, nonspecific degenerative disc disease, arthrosis of the joints of Luchka was noted in 1%, osteophytes in 17%, and posterior ridging in 6%. Cervical disc lesions were also highly prevalent, with central disc bulges seen in 5% of the total. 20% uh, had central herniations. Uh, generalized bulging was seen in 31%. Uh, Non-specified disc herniations in 1%. And a paracentral herniation with directionality in 14%. And if we look at the various spinal levels, we can see that the degenerative changes are more robust around the C5, C6 area than they are at other motion segments, as well as the contiguous motion segments of C4, C5, and C6, C7. Yet it is important to realize that they occur at different levels in different people. So once again, if we look at disc lesions at various vertebral levels, we again see uh, a somewhat higher prevalence at C5, C6, than we do at C4, C5, and C6 and C7, and above and below, even less. If we look at degenerative changes in another cohort, we again see that degenerative changes are very prevalent, 67% uh, total, and play changes, the modic changes were also seen in a significant number of individuals, uh, as well as disc bulging, uh, foraminal stenosis, central canal stenosis, facet joint arthrosis, and uncovertebral joint arthrosis. Uh, these high levels of prevalence suggest biomechanical dysfunction over a long term, resulting uh, from the putative vertebral subluxation. Even individuals that are considered healthy have a high prevalence of degenerative changes. These are individuals who were cadets for flight training. They were completely asymptomatic and considered otherwise healthy. But we can see that in the cervical spine, 68% demonstrated alterations of the physiological spinal curves. Um, and a very high percentage, 43% had disc bulges, 24% had disc protrusion, 12% demonstrated uh, disc desiccation. Spondylotic changes were noted in uh, nine of the cases. So we can see that these abnormal degenerative changes that we see on radiographs, as well as magnetic resonance imaging studies, demonstrate that pathomechanics can lead to degenerative changes and that these degenerative changes can compromise both somatic and autonomic nervous system function. Thank you for your attention.